morning, everyone. Or maybe it's afternoon. Maybe it's evening or even late night for some of you on live stream. Welcome. Welcome to the Google panel. For the next 30 minutes, we have a chance to ask our leaders all sorts of questions. Now, as some of you may know, Google has been instrumental in the creation of AMP and now actually employs a full-time team to contribute to the open source project. And as you all know, AMP helps publishers be successful on the web. So we thought it was appropriate to ask our leaders, who can now come on, yeah, um, their thoughts on Google, AMP, how Google thinks about the content ecosystem, and the future of content experiences on the web. Thank you, panelists, for joining us today. So let me start by introducing the team. We have with us David, or Bez, who's the VP of Engineering for our search product and the executive sponsor for AMP at Google. Ryuchi, who's our Engineering Director and the Site Lead for Google Japan. Dion, who heads um, Director of Web Developer Relations. And finally, Malta, who needs no introduction because you know him from the keynote, um, is our tech lead for AMP. My name is Manisha, and I lead web partnerships for APAC. So thank you so much for sending in all the questions. We've received all of them. And we've tried to pick the ones that have been voted the highest. We've also tried to pick the ones that are most relevant for most of you in this room, and the ones, of course, that are suitable for this leadership panel. So let's kick off with the first question, which is fairly pertinent, and I've been asked this a few times. Is there a risk that Google will abandon AMP like it has with some of its high-profile projects? <laughs> so I, I can, I'll give a technical answer to this. So um, I mean, I think the, uh, as the technical lead, I have to anticipate that no software lasts forever. And so there's all kinds of safeguards built into the AMP um, to, to outlast even Google Incorporated, basically, as a company. Because it's, first of all, an open source project that um, is licensed under Apache 2 license. And so like, if Google, for whatever reason, would decide to stop working on it, it would still be there, and, and, and folks could, could continue working on it. And then there's other, um, I think, thoughtful aspects to it. So for example, the AMP cache's URL format is designed such that you can actually just turn it into a redirect to the underlying document um, with like an Apache rewrite rule. You know, you don't even need a database. And so it's extremely easy to maintain backwards compatibility of the URL space um, into eternity, um, independent of the existence of the entities that used to run this, this, these um, URLs. So the, um, I think that's the technical answer that um, anticipates possible futures without making a comment about possible futures. Is there a non-technical answer? Anyone wants to have a go sure. at it? Uh, we are obviously very committed to AMP. It's something that we believe uh, very strongly in, uh, primarily because if you, know, if you look at the way we view Google Search, uh, which is one of the most ob obviously important projects at Google, one of the most important products we have, um, when a user comes to us with a question, it's really the entire end-to-end -end journey that we optimize for. And it's not just enough to make our part of the journey, our applications and our website, super fast. We need the entire journey to be fast, the entire journey to be an excellent experience, which means your sites have to be great, too. So we have a long history of investing in the web, investing in, in everything from training to making our own browser with Chrome to doing things like AMP on the format side, tools. We, we strongly uh, believe in, in a high performance and modern mobile friendly web. So it's something that we'll, we'll continue to invest in. Cool, thank you for the answer. Um, the second one here, maybe one for Malta. Will Google address the security concerns that Mozilla has raised about signed exchanges? I'll hand over to Dion. Sure. So um, uh, signed exchanges, it's all about, you know, building standards, and so we obviously work with those different standards groups, uh, and that's actually been going really well. We've had great relationship with the WebKit team, uh, with Apple, Mozilla's been pitching in. We're trying to balance the privacy side of things, the performance side of things, and there's different trade-offs on, if I sign this package, how do I know that you know, it's, it's not gonna be expired and out of date or something's gone wrong there? And so there's different proposals going on where we're, we're working on, you know, do we go back and have a call to the server so you, the publisher can have control over um, actually understanding what's in the package and the like, but that's a performance trade-off. Uh, so there's still work to be done, uh, but so far, you know, things are going really well, um, 
and uh, you can kind of watch in the different uh, you know, GitHub issues and the like to kind of see what's progressing there, but I'm uh, feeling really positive about it. Thanks. Ryuchi, question for you. So Google has a significant presence in Japan, um, and you're the site lead over here. What are some of the developments you're working on? What are the, some of the things that you can tell the audience about that might excite the developers in the room from Japan? Sure. Um, maybe I can recap on the, how we started this office. And we actually started on Google Japan as the first international office of Google in 2001. And we have grown to, so the, and that implies the importance of the market. And we have grown to over 1,000 people um, in this building. And the, we have on the multiple product and the teams on the search and ads and the uh, Geo, which is Google Maps, and then Chrome browser, and as you saw in a previous presentation, and the Chrome OS. And in addition to that, we have a research group on the Google Brain had started last year. So the, we have very diverse set of engineers on the, from the, on the systems design to the, on the machine learning type of engineer. This in the really small on the area. So that, that allows us to do the, on the much collaboration. Uh, so the, what is maybe most exciting for me right now is a col collaboration with the Chrome browser team. Now the under Mauti and me are the sister, sister team and they're reporting to the same manager here. So the under, we have the opportunity to work together um, between us as well as under with the Chrome browser team in Tokyo. Exciting, I look forward to more. Um, so in my role, as I speak to a number of partners, um, I get this feedback about the fact that it's really hard to build consistently great experiences on the web. Um, so my question to, to any of you is, what are we doing to make it easier for developers to build better experiences on the web, and how is AMP part of that vision? Sure. So um, we think people build pretty amazing things on the web. It's a really creative platform. Uh, we're really proud of, of what you all are able to, to do on the web. But we're also really frustrated with um, how hard it can be to build some of these experiences and the, uh, the end performance results. Uh, and so AMP is one fantastic way to kind of Right, rail in the right constraints and make sure you have a good experience. Um, you've heard today uh, about different tools like La Lighthouse uh, and the like. For right now, it's, it's vitally important that you're running Lighthouse consistently. You've got it in continuous integration. You've got performance budgets and the like, because it's just too easy to kind of get off of the rails. Um, I see this actually kind of as a bug, um, even though you know, I work closely with the Lighthouse team. Um, we need to get different, better rails in place for you where it's not as uh, needed for you to kind of make sure you're not set up. Uh, it's been great to kind of take some of the ideas from AMP and kind of bake them into the web platform so everyone gets to benefit from them. And we're working now really closely with uh, all of the major frameworks and the like to make sure that we can get you know, all of the good things that they're innovating on uh, and baking those into the platform as well. Uh, so we've got a lot more coming, uh, kind of pairing up with some of these frameworks, like you heard about Next on the AMP side. We've got other things that we're working on as well, um, and we're doing more on the kind of dev tool side um, and the like. Finally, uh, we have uh, created web.dev uh, as a way to kind of give you clear guidance. Uh, it's early days, but we're you know, really hoping to get a lot of the uh, the correct guidance, baking in our tools so you can use Lighthouse directly and kind of see things tracked over time uh, so you can make sure that you've got one place to go where you know what to do to deliver great experiences. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Anyone else want to chime in? No? Cool. I love this next question. It's one of my favorites. Because again, you know, we have a lot of um, people in the countries that I work in ask me this question. So this one says, I'm an AMP lover and I want to do AMP, but we don't have an in-house engineer. Should we use an agency? What is your suggestion? Many of us are in the same situation. Can you give us some advice? So a lot of people really keen on the product, understand the benefits, love it. But it's hard if you don't have a development team in place. Sure, I can take a cr uh, crack at this. Uh, there's, um, there's a lot of uh, energy on supporting AMP in the CMS uh, ecosystem, which we are pretty excited by uh, because it enables people to get the benefits of AMP without having to have in-house engineers. So AMP has been uh, well supported by WordPress. And you'll, I think you'll see later today um, a really nice uh, presentation from the internal team at Google that's been working on, on the WordPress code to make this, make this plugin um, awesome. Uh, but there's lots of of different CMSs and different technology uh, stacks out there that do, in fact, support AMP. So, you know, if this is something that's important to you and you don't have an engineering team and you're not building your pages yourself, ask your your CMS tool and and see what you can do. 
Um, you'll find that in general, a lot of the middleware from this, everything from the CMS to the ad networks to the analytics networks um, and you know, everything, paywalls, et cetera, all that stuff has been a big focus of uh, outreach for us for the last few years to help bring them on, on board so that these tools are available to people who want to want to use them in, in AMP. Yeah, so that's a good starting point. Look at your CMS to see if there's some. And Go ahead. hopefully you saw the new training course that was out there, so maybe you want to kind of pick it up and play with it a bit yourself. Good plug. And another one for AMP.dev. Um, thank you for that. When will AMP pages reach desktop search results? Um, so we would love them to, I think. Uh, in in principle, AMP pages work on desktop today, first of all. Uh, if you look at AMP.dev, which is our uh, web page for, for the AMP project, um, it is a just an AMP first, AMP canonical page. So it, obviously it works on desktop, it works on mobile, it's responsive. Uh, it's a beautiful page on desktop. Uh, so AMP pages do work well on desktop. but They do need to be designed for desktop. You do need to use responsive design. You need to think about users loading it on desktop. And early on when AMP was started, uh, we didn't talk much about that. In fact, the name of AMP, uh, the M stands for mobile. So it's a, maybe in some ways we kind of hinted maybe, maybe it's more focused on mobile. Um, and so a lot of the content that's actually out there isn't designed responsively in AMP today, which is, a, which is a little bit of a problem. If we wanted to use it on search on the desktop, we'd wind up redirecting users to content where there'd be a very you know, thin slice of content in the middle with large gutters on both sides. Uh, so it's hard for us to, to send a lot of uh, traffic that would, pages that wouldn't look very good. Um, but for AMP Stories, this is an area where we're really excited by this because as we look at stories on the desktop, they just look beautiful, especially the work you saw um, John and Hong show uh, yesterday. It, it, it's actually quite a lovely format in landscape uh, and on the desktop. And so there's an area here where we have a new start um, with the format because this part is, is pretty new and it's explicit. So there's a tag you can leave in the markup that says it's responsive and built to be responsive. And so maybe that's an area we'll start to look at on search if we get content there that would look really good on desktop. Uh, but in general, we're, we're very excited by AMP um, in search, and we will use it where it makes sense. Thank you. Um, the next question I'd love to throw to both Search and Chrome. So Search has obviously evolved in the past few years. How does Search view their role in the open web? And in a similar vein, how does Chrome view their role in the open web? And I know some of you represent both teams, so. Okay, uh, let me start. So the, I think primarily on the, we have playing two roles on my understanding on the search on the, to the open ecosystem on o open web. And the first is on the, our long standing mission that and connect on the users and the content creators. So the, the, it started, it's evolving, of course, and the, it started with on the U type search query, and then we showed the, the 10 results. And that was a starting point, but it, now we're evolving to the, the query less like on Discover or the more visual format, et cetera. But on the fundamental, what we're doing is the connect on the users to you guys. So this is the primary thing and that we can contribute to the under in this way. And second part is the under a little bit more opinionated, but under for example under in the past we did on the mobile friendly ranking change, uh, which under rank the pages that under friendly to mobile uh, to be higher. And the this is under massive change and in terms of ranking. And the under, we followed by the under, we have the interstitial on the page demotion, or recently under we launched the slow page demotion. And these are our second role that under we want to carefully nudge the web ecosystem in a way that and that will benefit both users and publishers, content creators in the long term. So the, we are really, really careful and not destroy or distract the under too much. But under when we see the under there's a something that an opportunity for the long term, and uh, we sometimes use, play that role very carefully. Cool. And then on Chrome, I work on the web platform within Chrome, and it's kind of like uh, working for Tesla, wanting electric cars to to take off. That's kind of how I feel a little bit on the Chrome side. You know, our job isn't about just getting people using Chrome. Uh, it's more about making sure that all of the users out there are meaningfully engaging on the web and having a great experience. And so we get to push the web forward by pushing the platform forward uh, and obviously making sure that Chrome, the browser itself, is really a, uh, a compelling uh, application to actually get that engagement 
But that's really what our, we see our role is, is just making sure that the platform itself is ready and that the content is fantastic for users and then obviously for Google as well. Cool, thank you. So we do many things at Google. We've got many teams at Google, um, but it's not so clear perhaps to the external world. So I'd love for someone to articulate uh, the relationship uh, and how the future looks for search, AMP, and news. So that kind of complex interrelationship. I'm not sure what you mean, but so, so at the, another question that popped up on the on the um, on Slido was, uh, you know, what is the relationship between AMP and Google News, for instance? Sure. Uh, so uh, Google News uh, is a product that that we uh, we make at Google, um, which has on has a mobile version and a desktop version, and on, and on the mobile version, it prefers AMP as the uh, publishing format because it makes the experience uh, much much better for users as they're reading content. So you can see this today if you go use the Google News app on, on your phone. Uh, whenever you click an article, it opens up you know, very, very quickly. Uh, and so we've been very excited by, uh, by the development of AMP and being able to use it inside our own products at Google. We use it inside Google News. We use, obviously, we use it inside Search. Um, and so that's an area that's pretty, uh, pretty important to us. Uh, we also are publishers of AMP documents. Something I hear often is, does Google use AMP um, not only do we consume it in, in most of our products, we actually do produce it as well. Uh, if you look at our official company blog, for example, it's in AMP format. Um, so we, we do like to, to use AMP as well. Cool. Did you want to? I can talk about the kind of general vision of where we see things. So like three years from now, we've kind of got three major pillars in the way we think about things. Uh, one is the web content pillar. And so AMP lives very much uh, in this pillar, and it's ju just about making sure the content experience is fantastic, that you've got you know, great experience within just the content they consume in, but more than that, like we heard earlier talking about portals and the like, you should be able to just kind of float through, through the web like you're just going through a magazine. And right now, that magazine is really slow to turn pages at times. And so we just want to kind of blow past that and just make sure there's a great experience, seamless transactions, all of that kind of good stuff at the base level. Uh, then we have the, the web app side of things, which is more about making sure that you've got all of the rich capabilities you know, on mobile, on desktop and the like. So we have desktop PWAs now across all of the browsers. We've got trusted web activities to get you fantastic experiences that can get you know, really well uh, embedded into the Android side of things, and then obviously across mobile in general. And then we have a developer success pillar, which is really just making sure that you can get the best possible ROI when you're developing on the, on the web. So you get this full reach across all of these devices, you know, globally, everything else, and we have fantastic tools for you uh, to make it as easy as possible. And obviously, uh, AMP fits into that. Nice segue into the next question. So just a bit like Dion did, I don't mind if you would put on your visionary hats to tell us what you think the future of the web and content experiences might be in the next two to three, five years. I'll start so everyone else gets to say the same. No, <laughs> no. I, I, so I want to pick up, I mean, obviously um, what Dion just said with the, the portals as the new primitive to make navigation from site to site on the web just feel more seamless and more integrated. Um, that really is aligned with what we were trying to do with AMP in the, in the first place, and it now kind of finds its way into web standards, and then um, also to like a larger percentage of the web beyond, beyond AMP is certainly something that, that um, we're working towards and, and want to see in two to three years. One of the things that I mentioned in the keynote yesterday was how I see stories as this, uh, I think I said, like first, um, medium that was truly designed for like the portrait phone experience, and so I think along those lines, what my what I'm thinking is that that we're actually still like le learning how to use phones, and that what we've done so far is that we, you know, thought we knew what the web was, and then you know just made it smaller to fit on the screen with responsive design, but we didn't, there was no, no, no transformation going on. It was mostly an application of, of, of the existing stuff, which is very reasonable because we were work, you know, we knew it was already working. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's the greatest, uh, like first approximation of what one, one might do. But I think that as, you know, the phone and portrait mode becomes the primary consumption mode for, for content, we will see that things are evolving in that direction. And so that obviously M Stories is, is going, you know, 
with that trend, but I also don't think it's the end of the road and then that we'll see other things like that emerging from, from folks who you know, grew up on their phones and, and have never you know, used the, the internet any, any other way. Richie? Yeah. Um, I'm seeing this on the, I work only in the search team and in these 10 years and the, I'm seeing this is from the search users on the journey perspective, like on the, yes, on the weekend as a search team and they can make the search and result page on the beautiful and the fast to load. But on the, in the end, the user clicked on the result and finding the content on the, on the landing page. So the, on the web search is on the, like on the closer loop on the, when actually users have a great experience on the landing page. And the, there is a reason the, and the as I mentioned before, the, we try to sometimes play a role to influence on web system. And what I'm excited about an AMP is uh, some best practices or the most of the best practices already embedded. So the, the, we tried hard to under, like, influence webmasters, uh, no pop-ups or the, the distant latency implement, et cetera. Um, but the, by using the AMP, and the, most of the things is just there. And the, this is important because the, and the, if you think about on the user's experience, and the, even if the, you make your site really excellent, but and the, if the, some other sites are not really doing great, and the people's perception about web is like, and the, okay, and the web is slow, and the, only affected by like on the small fraction of bad pages. So the, and the, what I really want to see in the, in the near future is a web and search as a general, like on the really snappy and the good experience as a whole, and the user never uh, felt like on the frustration or the, the friction um, in their journey. And that's not what I want to see. Amazing, thanks. Sure. Uh, so w I think one way to think about where the web is going to go is, is to really think about the user's expectations in their day-to-day -day life of computing and what kind of experiences that they are used to. And what we're seeing as a trend is more and more users are coming online uh, where their first computer is a phone. Their phone is their experience with the internet. And this is, this is happening worldwide in, in, in new, uh, and in existing markets as well with the youth. The phone is just taken over as the primary computing device. So to understand what users are going to expect, you really have to understand what their experience is today. And most users are spending their time on phones in games. Like if you look at where they spend their time, they spend their time on their phone in messaging apps and productivity and, and surfing the web, but a lot of time is being spent in games. So to us, uh, you know, uh, we might think of the web uh, and might think of the phone as basically a web browser. It's, an, it's a device for productivity or for, for navigating the web. But to our users, increasingly, they think of it like a PlayStation. Like their phone is a game console. That's a lot of where they spend their time. So how does that change the expectations that they have when they go to look for content? Well, they would expect it to be more interactive. They expect it to be more you know, visual, more rich. They expect it to be faster, obviously. Um, so I, I, I think you'll see things like stories that have emerged that uh, play into that model that they're, they're much more full screen. They're not, you know, scrolling based things. They're, they're full screen at a time. They have a lot of motion. They have a lot of animation um, and new interaction models that are more touch oriented. You'll see just that increase as a trend line over the next few years as, as users who are habituated to, to treating their phones like game machines um, start to navigate your content and your applications. So I, where that will wind up, I have no idea, but it's actually very exciting to me because we really haven't had a big change of, of user expectations and interface in a very long time. And I think that's coming. I think we're actually on the vanguard of that. Amazing, thank you. We've got a few minutes left. I just have one last question. Um, we've got lots of amazing things we've announced at AmConf yesterday and we will do today. Um, new things that are coming out. What are you most excited by? Can I say two things? Of course. One, well, so I'm most excited and really uncomfortably excited about AmpScript. Um, I think many of you will be, like it's a, it's a big change for AMP and we will, I'm, I'm, ex, I'm excited not as much as a web developer uh, that wants to use it, but I'm excited to see what it does to AMP um, and how it changes how people use the format. So that's, I think, just intellectually really interesting. And then on the other side, much more forward looking, um, Rudy yesterday in his talk talked about Bento AMP. Um, the, I think what we didn't mention so much is that this is really an, uh, the first time we're rethinking the architecture of the AMP JavaScript library from the ground up. Uh, so 
technically a rewrite. And literally, the state of the engineering project is that this is a prototype, but we're giving ourselves a year to land it. Like that's how big of a change it is. Um, so I'm, you know, excited because we announced it here, <laughs> and but we haven't really, you know, done all of the work, which is also great because it's an open source project, and you could see it anyway. Like it's happening there, right? Um, so I'm always pro s telling people about these things, um, but um, I'm definitely excited to see whether that actually turns out to work. But I'm also very confident about it. I was actually going to lead with Bento M2. I just feel like with you know HTML, there's like all of these tags that you never use that are like really d random document oriented tags, and then we just kind of stopped and we stopped adding these these features. And now we're in this mobile world where everyone just wants a nav drawer or some tabs of these basic you know carousel and the like, and uh, you know it's kind of painful to me to watch developers like searching on npm. You know, where you get variable quality, there's amazing stuff there, and there's some other stuff. Uh, and so you download this thing that's got 50 megs of dependencies, and it's just, ah, this is a hellish situation. So get into a world where uh, you know, the work that goes into building a high quality component that's general enough, can be styled correctly, accessible fast. Um, every, you know, every developer shouldn't be having to do that for uh, the things that they're building. So I feel like adding that into the pool from the AMP side uh, to come along with things that are coming on material and lots of things that are out there in the community. Um, I'm really excited about that. And then uh, portals for that vision of, I can't wait for a world where I'm sitting on Slack or Hangouts chat or something, someone posts in a URL, and it's kind of the live thing actually in there. And I kind of like could just zoom into that world and just navigate and really get back to kind of browsing the web again. Uh, many exciting things, but if I choose one, probably I'm going to choose an AMP stories still. And uh, yeah, I visited many other different countries and uh, to uh, know more about on the user, especially young users, and the, and the, as Beth said, and the, how different they see on the, and the phone and content consumption. And they do a lot of search, information seeking search on YouTube, for example. And we really need to move towards a visual uh, because uh, that's the end of where users are already there. So then the AMP story is one step forward and we allow, allow us to make another step. That's really exciting to me. I, I obviously, I echo everything that they said. I, I would add uh, AMP script for me, I think is uh, also uncomfortably exciting. Um, but the possibility it opens up is quite profound to, to make some new kinds of experiences on AMP possible that weren't just weren't possible before, especially in e-commerce where you can do it. Uh, folks like AliExpress are doing it. Um, successfully making an AMP-first uh, e-commerce site, it's just way more difficult than it, than it really needs to be. And things like AMP Script open that up uh, to make it a lot more accessible. And I'm pretty excited to see what will happen with that. Thank you. If you'd ask me, I'd probably just say AMP.dev because I'm just excited that we have one place with everything AMP. Um, thank you so much for your answers. Sadly, we've run out of time, so we've got to wrap up the panel. Thank you for being amazing panelists. Thank you for being an amazing audience and sending in some really sharp questions. Um, and with that, we have to wrap up. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day and enjoy the rest of AMP conference. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.